unique lecture because it will engage both sexes, both male and female lecturers. Good old friend Chaba Play, who is a professor of psychology in Hungary, but he has been before he was going to the Central University in Budapest as a emeritus professor. Yeah. He has been professor in at least five different countries in at least seven different universities. If I count well, your curriculum vitae, including Bloomington, Rutgers University, Trieste, uh, Budapest, Vienna, yeah. whatever. And then Chaba, after a few minutes or half an hour, will give the word to his wife, Oti, who is also a professor of psychology in Budapest. So with this unique lecture, you will cross the gender boundaries here in Singapore. Yeah. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm trying to activate this thing. So we're trying to cross the boundaries, as the suggestions were, para lima. So I'm trying to cross the boundaries first. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about research on perception and cognition related to a sort of cross-cultural framework, and then I'm moving towards my own research, which is basically on language. And I'm showing you, first I will show some data that can be criticized along the lines uh, that were raised already today uh, in the starting talk by Professor Arbib that all these east-west differentiation are rather questionable. So I'm first going to show some questionable research on this, and then I'm going to show that in the domain of language itself, that was my main uh, empirical domain, this whole issue of east-west differences as related to processing differences are rather sort of clumsy. And then I'm going to give the word, crossing the boundaries, to my co-author, Otilia, who crossing the boundaries more she is even my wife. And she's going to talk a little bit about how these differences are related or are not so simply related to conflict resolution and other emotionally important issues. Now, what I'm doing now. All right. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the different approaches people are taking to, to the possible impact of culture on different cognitive processes. We heard a lot about these issues in the presentation of uh, professors Kloninger and Savinch regarding personality differences. But I'm not going to talk about personality, but about different possibilities of the impact of culture on cognition. One may start from two radical visions. One radical vision is uh, sort of supposed by many innatist people in the cognitive field that which claims that life and thought patterns are entirely universal and our mind and brain are forming universal representations and so on. And this is many times accompanied by the idea, we saw it from the Descartes quote in the beginning by Balage today, that uh, in fact we are entirely rational and Salt and the world of representations are not affected by our social and emotional being, and so on. The other idea is that the mind is entirely, the human mind is entirely flexible. Of course, these are radical ideas. And uh, the mind and brain are actually entirely formed under the impact of culture. And usually this goes together with the idea that we as social beings are entirely emotional, and our cognitive domains are entirely transparent to emotional influences, and so on. Uh, let me show one famous example of contrasting these two radical visions with a third compromise vision. That's the compromise vision. That, that is presented in another domain of discussion regarding whether the human mind has a modular organization that is unaffected by culture, or that's the other radical view, the modular organization of the human mind and brain or whatsoever is entirely influenced top-down by cultural contacts. And 
So our supposedly primary modules are, are modified under the influence of culture. And the compromise view, which many of us share, including myself, believes that there certainly are primary or elementary networks in our human nervous system that are not easily influenced by cultural context. However, many of the important human achievements are influenced by culture in when, when the outputs of these elementary, represent, elementary processings are somehow entering the, the consciousness or self-related notions or whatsoever. I'm not going to go into the details, but somehow cultural patterns do have an influence, but not entirely top down. That's the sort of compromised idea. So let me first show you a few examples, not of our own research, but much cited and very much discussed research, which tries to relate these ideas to the differences between so-called Eastern and Western approaches to different perceptual and cognitive tasks. These are the studies uh, done mainly by Richard Nisbet and his followers, which start from the idea that a supposed Eastern mind, in most of these studies, the Eastern mind and the Eastern perception and so on is usually studied by, by uh, East Asian subjects. It's basically relation-oriented in perceptual and cognitive task is more prototype-oriented and usually pays attention to holes and relations and usually is accompanied, that's the much discussed part, with a less individualistic social life and so on. And in this sort of uh, primary characterization, the Western mind is supposed to be more item-oriented, feature-oriented, pays more attention to elements. Actually, in Nisbet's theory, the whole idea is that culture is basically having this impact on the primary cognitive processes by, by uh, directing our attention. So attention is more directed to elements, and this is usually accompanied by a cultural context of extremely individualized and so on. Let me show you a few examples from the studies of Nisbet. A very famous, much cited, very simple example is when uh, people, subjects are presented with a target object and they have to decide whether this flower or whatever belongs to group one or group two. Just think a little bit about what you would put if you were forced to choose whether to put it here or to put it there. And then uh, I'm going to show you some of the results. So the results show that actually uh, in the left, if you put it, oh, I'm sorry, to the left, then uh, what you basically do, you look for a common feature. This is the common feature. Therefore, this belongs here. However, if you look for a general pattern, a prototype similarity, then you would move this target object to group two. And what you find comparing uh, uh, Asian Americans with European Americans, you find a difference that the family resemblance related group two belongingness is used by more by East Asians and Asian Americans, and the European Americans are using more the item base. That's sort of one of the much cited results. A similar study again by the group of Nisbet is just uh, asking people to watch simple scenes. Actually, these are not static scenes, so you, we cannot really repeat the experiments. These are uh, short video clips, and uh, you can see that there is a lot of variety, but there are easily identified individual targets and so on. And again, in a free recall situation, Usually what you find is that Americans usually start with the relatively big size stimuli. Japanese subjects start more with details. And also in recognition studies, Japanese subjects' recognition errors are much more context dependent. And the American <coughs> subjects, there is much more context independence. Mm, there is some other studies I'm going to jump these. Nisbet is trying to sort of summarize these results 
as, uh, by claiming that the Eastern approach to perceptual and cognitive task is more context oriented. And usually, that's a very dangerous or much debated claim that the social considerations are directing the subjects in East Asian cultures more to relations. And then uh, in the Western orientation, there is a more individualistic social orientation that is directing our, our uh, attention and perception more to details. Fine. I'm not going to discuss, because many, many issues have been already raised regarding how, how much easy is to characterize Western and Eastern regarding the populations here and so on. Actually, Nisbet was trying to, to soften his position. He made also some studies in Eastern Europe, in the Balkan area, and so on. And he had been basically showing that people from the Balkan area are uh, sh showing a more versatile or more mixed attitude and so on. What I'm going to move to is whether all of this is true for language as well. All of this whole and part or relation and item orientation. Uh, of course, regarding the relationship between perception, thought, and language, there is a long tradition from the mid uh, early 19th century so on from uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, and then in the American scene, Worf has sort of rejuvenated these ideas in the 1930s. Uh, the basic idea was that language determines thought, and, and this is shown in the effect of grammatical and lexical patterns on, on, uh, on different aspects of human cognition. In the original idea proposed by Humboldt and by Worf and so on, there was a circularity because there were no behavioral claims. However, later on, in the, from the mid 20th century on, this idea whether language has an interesting influence on our perception and cognition has been taking shape more using uh, exact behavioral measures. And there were different research sort of trends. First, in the 1950s, many people were claiming that there are large differences due to language, and there is an overall relativity. Language sort of determines the way we perceive the world. Then, in the six, from the 60s on, on, mainly under the influence of Chomsky and other people, there was the idea of a radical universalism, that uh, language is an innate ability. You know the big story of Chomsky. And there is, there is sort of modularity. Language and perception are two different domains, and so on. From the 80s on, both in linguistic circles and within psychology it, itself, more uh, intricate typological ideas have come up. Not personality typological, but language typological ideas, uh, realizing that, of course, we acquire different languages during our lifespan. So you have to accommodate, even in a biological theory of language, you have to accommodate for parameters. That was Chomsky's term, or processing types, and so on, which resulted in a more constrained relativity. I'm going to show some data supporting this constrained relativity uh, idea. So. Uh, Series of studies in the, in, initiated by the late Liz Bates and Brian McQueenie were comparing some dozen languages. I'm going to show you only a few. In uh, sentence interpretation tasks where the sentence materials were varied in many regards using grammatical and, and cognitive features, grammatical features like word order, case marking, cognitive features like Animacy, for example, whether, whether the objects manipulated or presented in the sentence are, are uh, more uh, animate or inanimate, like an animate would be a human agent, like the boy, inanimate would be the pencil, and so on. What you find is interestingly in all these studies that there is certainly in language too, there is an analytic, non configurational approach to language. 
And there is a more holistic, more configurational approach to language. If you move from Turkish to English, you see the examples. And these are uh, in children and adults. The importance of the different factors manipulated. So what you can see as one very simple thing in Turkish, Turkish children, already two and a half year old Turkish children, are absolutely relying when interpreting sentences or grammar. They are relying on case markers. If you take Hungarian and Valpiri, then young children, two-year-old children, still are relying on a cognitive factor, animacy. And later on, they are going to move towards case. Now, I'm highlighting Hungarian and Valpiri because that shows that this is absolutely unrelated to these cognitively much emphasized east-west difference. Who knows where is Valpiri spoken? Yeah, it's an Australian Aboriginal language. Absolutely, un both historically and in all regards unrelated to Hungarian. And actually, Hungarian and Valpiri speakers are the most similar in their sentence processing. So it's not an east-west issue, but seemingly it's similar to this Nisbet kind of stuff because it's like an analytic and pattern based issue but it's 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 based on other factors uh, let me show you some example from my hungarian from our hungarian studies how does it work in hungarian for example uh, in children we know from uh, infancy research that children around 8 months 8, 10 months, already differentiate between animate and inanimate objects with the animates are those which have a random pattern of movements, and inanimates are which have an inertia-based pattern of movement. That's fine enough. Now, of course, children in all languages, since they have this cognitive template of animacy, try to start using animacy to break the code in the language. But what happens in Hungarian, you have to unlearn. So what in the youngest group we studied, this is three is actually two and a half. Animacy is still important, but it decreases in importance, as you can see. And order is important only at one specific age, around four year olds. And while animacy drops, case marking increases its importance. And that, that shows the details in one type of sentence. And, you can see that together, as the importance of case marking increases in the mind of children, animacy loses its importance. It's important, uh, well, for those few people here who are not native speakers of Hungarian. In Hungarian, we don't have uh, grammatical animacy effects, so we don't have any differences between animate and inanimate according to agreement. But we don't have lexical animacy either. So skin and leather are the same word in Hungarian. It's, be, it's word. It doesn't depend whether it's animate or inanimate. So it's uh, all of the Finno Greek and actually all, all uh, Uralic languages are this type. Again, just as a footnote, does this mean that Hungarian children cannot distinguish between dead and alive? It doesn't mean. So they, Actually, they still keep the cognitive difference, but they are learning not to use it in language. I'm sorry, case. Oh, case means here uh, Hungarian, like Turkish and Valpiri here, are very strongly case marking languages. So we have about. Uh, in Latin, you have six cases, like accusative, dative, and so on. In Hungarian, we have a little bit more, depending on the grammatical theory you're taking, we have between 22 and 25 case markers, different case markers. So it's a very complex system. But by the age of three, the children are already handling all the 25 cases. It's not that difficult, because most of these cases are cognitively transparent, like in, on, of, by, and so on. So like the cases related to space distinctions are very numerous, and it's easy to handle. Uh, the more grammatical cases, such as accusative, are a little bit trickier. But that's 
that's what is meant by case. So, and uh, what we actually started to claim together with George Gergay, one of my co-authors, actually that in languages such as English, or as far as I know, Chinese also, which have a poor morphology, uh, you can contrast languages which have a poor morphology with languages which have a rich morphology. Hungarian has a rich morphology. A noun can have over 300 different forms. In Finnish, over 500 different forms. One single noun. So like, into my houses, that's a, a noun suffix with four different suffixes and so on. Now, in what we find or we claim that actually in these non-configurational languages, which have a rich morphology, the language processing is using fast decisions. It uses a localistic model. And the memory loads are not over clauses or sentences. Or working memory is mainly used over words to, co to compute the meaning of that given word. While in poor morphology languages, such as English and so on, decisions are much slower. They have they are using a more relation-based holistic model, and the memory sort of restrictions or the working memory use is mainly over phrases or clauses. We actually found some, we have some data that shows that this is a little bit interestingly and non-trivially related to brain development. So usually between the ages two and five or six, you see an increasing left hemisphere uh, reliance on language processing. That's fine. Interestingly, that's, uh, this left hemisphere reliance in English is related to a more and more strict use of word order in interpreting sentences. Interestingly, in Hungarian, it's the other way around. The more left brain localized a child is, the less the child is using word order. And the more the child is only using case marking, as the most, because case marking is the most important grammatical feature in Hungarian, while in English, word order is the most Im important grammatical feature. Uh, so the basic idea here, as a conclusion, is that the language differences, certainly there are typological differences, but they are not related to East and West distinctions. They are related to intricacies of the internal organization of the grammar of the given language, which is an interesting demand on children to, to, to sort of uh, accommodate to. And it is seemingly similar to all this holistic and, uh, and item-based processing proposed by Nisbet. But it's not at all related to any East and West cultural difference. It's related to the internal issues of language. So now we're going to move towards more, uh, more happiness issues. I'm just mentioning our uh, old friend, Mihai Chinksen Mihai, who has another theory compared to the one we heard from uh, Professor Kroninger about uh, happiness and so on. But he also of tries to accommodate the issue of anxiety and boredom. And he has this whole theory which, which sort of believes that there is a, a certain uh, limited way or a limited flow where you can have an enough uh, skill and challenge but at the same time, not to have anxiety and so on. And many studies by him and Seligman and others have been trying to show how this related to, to happiness and so on along cultures. Uh, I'm not going to go into any details of this, but many studies, many, many sort of sociological studies were uh, correlated with these ideas, basically showing some. Uh, interesting data on what kind of uh, large social factors have, a, have an influence on happiness and so on. However, uh, together with these general sort of sociological proposals, 
within the so-called positive psychology group, there were some uh, dualities raised, one author, Bacon, raised that actually there are two different types of strengths which are associated to different kind of, uh, of happiness uh, or good life. One is the balance based, the other is the targeted and focus based idea. And he sort of tries to claim that these are two, two basic uh, possibilities in our approach towards a good life. Many others try to relate these very loose ideas with uh, Eastern and Western uh, um, cultural attitudes and so on. Uh, but many people also sort of uh, criticized these ideas of comparing uh, uh, Western, so-called Western and Eastern uh, cultural attitudes regarding good life. One very interesting critical paper by Christopher and Higginbottom claims that actually within all these comparative approaches, there is a hidden individualistic assumption. And usually they are both geographically and in other ways pre presenting very clearly, supposedly clearly faced, but false dichotomies. And they are usually ignoring the issue that the cultural meanings, just the meaning of a word we were discussing yesterday with Professor Kloninger that, for example, the Hungarian word happy, boldog, has an inherent double meaning from the 12th century on, because boldog also means uh, saint in Hungarian. So it means happy, but it also, also all the Hungarian saints were called boldog, happy. And that, no, but that is an important underlying difference in the whole, and if you use for present day teenagers just the word bulldog, of course this other meaning is non-consciously uh, activated and so on. So you have to have very careful in these comparative studies. Now, uh, I'm going to give the floor to Otilia. She's trying to show how this is related to the uh, issue of conflict management and well-being relation. So I, I'm going to talk about conflict and conflict resolution and um, the role uh, and importance that conflict pays, uh, plays in our life. Uh, who thinks conflicts are bad? All of you like conflict? Oh, okay, okay, at least one. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, at least one, one confederate is here. So um, actually, uh, in real life, so this is not, not a representative of, for, for real life uh, situations, people think that conflicts are really bad because, because conflicts uh, um, raise tensions and conflicts are just it's impossible to predict the outcome of conflict. And people are very ambiguous about the next step, what will happen in the next minute. So some people just like to avoid conflict and just hope and pray for the best. Uh, but it, this might not be the best strategy for, for resolving conflict. So if, if, if you think that um, a well-being um, depends on social, emotional, psychological, and spiritual well-being, then this is the a social part of it. So if, if, if we want um, a secure, safe environment, um, a lot of friends who are around us, and a life without tension, and a life without stress, then we need to know that conflicts are inevitable. So there are conflicts all the time and all the possible places in the world, because the world cannot exist without conflicts. Um, so um, the, e everything is, is, is on the move. Everything is moving in the world. Uh, it doesn't matter that, whether it's, it's alive or inanimate. And um, it cannot be fully controlled, not even the subatomic level or in the large scale. And what happens when, when, when the, just 
two things collide? Who wins? The one that is bigger, the one that has higher energy and power. And what happens when the larger one wins? What happens to the little one? Just will be destroyed. So it's a win and lose game in the nature. Uh, we also have conflicts, uh, but we are very lucky comparing to uh, the inanimate parts of the world because we can decide. And um, uh, we can evaluate what's going on around us, and we have several choices, and we have the chance to pick up the right and the best choice. I, I just like to go back to the uh, second slide. Uh, who knows what's there on the right of the slide? A fish. What can you see in the mouth of the fish? Uh, almost X, almost X. They are the little ones. They are the kids. They are the kids. And uh, which parent is it? Oh, the father. Yes, this is the father. So there might be conflicts on the same level of life. So instincts are conflicting one another. So there is one instinct that, okay, I'd like to have a good lunch. Uh, let's, let's just swallow them and send them down because it feels good to, 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 to eat. And the other one, uh, the parental instinct. I, I, I have to handle them very carefully. I have to nurture them because this is the future of the species of my species. Of course, they, they uh, don't contemplate the way like it. So everything happens on the level of, level of instinct. Um, and if um, that the first one uh, wins, that, all right, I have a good lunch and I don't care what's happening afterwards, then probably this species will disappear from the stage of life or evolution because evolution is not adaptive. So the conclusion, even at this level, that we always have to find evolutionary adaptive versions of conflict resolution, even if it's not coded in our genes. So uh, we, we, we can classify conflicts. Uh, there are intraperson intrapersonal conflicts. And I, I don't think we, we should be much uh, curious about, about them right now, because uh, they are not relevant here. Extrapersonal. Extrapersonal conflicts might be relevant because, because uh, there is a conflict between the interest of the individual or a group and the environment. So it's, it's for example, about how to exploit Earth or the world or the oceans. Shall we eat the fish out of the ocean? Or, or, or shall we just um, um, reduce our, our eager? Um, what we are really interested in right now is the interpersonal conflict. Conflict uh, between individuals and between groups. Um, so why do we have different interests in the first place? Because we have different needs. Uh, what are the basic needs? We would like to survive uh, on the individual level and on the level of species. And this is crucial. It's very important. We want to eat. Um, um, we want to drink. We, have, we, we want to live somewhere. We need space. We need territory. And we need um, mates. Because the survival of the group is also important. And of course, there are higher level spiritual needs, like autonomy, competence related to spirituality. And they are culturally de uh, determined. So it's not, it, it doesn't mean the same for all cultures. For example, freedom. So there, there is a Western uh, concept of freedom or democracy, which might not be exported to some other parts of the world. Um, it can be manifested at a behavioral, verbal, and mental level, uh, because how do we know that other people uh, have conflicts or some, some others have conflicts with us? Because we can see from their behavior uh, and from their look. Or they just tell us, or they don't tell us, but just spread uh, dirty rumors behind our back. 
And uh, on the mental level, um, sometimes uh, people just don't admit to themselves that they have conflicts. But they try to repress and postpone uh, the resolution of, of problems. So what, what is, what is uh, the ultimate goal of, of uh, conf conflict on, on, on the evolutionary level, on the level of instinct? Um, what do the participants want? They want to win. They want to conquer. And if it's necessary, they want to exterminate. They want to kill the other one, the enemy. Um, we think that there are two levels on, 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 on conflict resolution skills. So the first level, on the first level, the skills are probably inherited. So they are coded in our, in our genes. But on the second level, uh, culture must, must, must intervene. And learning and educating people for conflict resolution is inevitable. Um, I just, I just go to, to this slide now. So everything is because um, of the survival, the need for survival. And we know this principle very well, that sur survival of the fittest uh, will conquer. So aggression is inborn. It has a long evolutionary history. So the conclusion is that there might be or must be uh, some very powerful inborn type of coping. So we must have inherited inborn, inborn coping mechanisms. Uh, because if we make a distinction between in-group and out-group, and we said, all right, all right, uh, we, group A, do not like group B. Let's go and kill them. Okay. But what happens if I have a conflict within, with somebody within my group, I can't just go and kill it or kill him because, because sooner or later the whole group uh, will be extincted. So I must find some other ways to, to cope with conflict and to keep the relationship with the other person. And uh, that we see on the level of, of primates. Yes, yes, yes. yes. They, they, they have inherited skills. They have inborn skills. So whenever they, they get into fight, it happens quite often. Uh, after some minutes, they go together and try to reconcile. Uh, usually it, it happens uh, through, through touch, uh, uh, physical, physical communication, because it feels good. So touching another person, a gentle touch, feels just good. Um, uh, we all know about bonobos. They found out the panacea, the best solution, just give sex to the other, uh, to anyone in any circumstances, to, to, for any reason, and everything goes fine. So uh, actually, this is not sex. So it, 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 it doesn't depend on, on, on the sex or, or, or the gender, the gender of, of the animals. They just, they just reconcile, just, just go together and say, OK, no problem. So what, what, what is the script? The script is that um, we had a fight. I wanted something you had. I won. So I'm, I'm the leader. All right. So I have no more problem. So let's go together. There is no forgiveness. Uh, uh, actually, we think at least that no forgiveness in, on, on, the end, on, the level of, on the level of primates. They just stop fighting. When, when it's, it's, it's absolutely clear who is the winner and who is the loser, that why should we fight any longer? Let's stop it. Uh, is, is it the same with humans? No, because we have memory. We have memories for, from the past. And, and we have a concept of future, a concept of time. That's different from, from the animals. Um, why, what, what, what are the advantages of? Of, of making peace uh, with the former enemy, um, because because uh, the winner got what he wanted. 
both of them might need the relationship. It, it has no use of, of collecting atoms within the group, in an in-group in group, uh, uh, circumstances. It reduces tension. All fights or conflicts just make the individuals, make the participants tense. They, they impose threat on the individuals. They uh, leave, they, they have set, uh, they have stress. They are stressed. And it is uncomfortable. So stress reduction and tension reduction is good because everything goes back to the normal level and it feels fine. Um, and um, the final outcome, the final, final best thing that comes out of a, um, a conflict resolution that life just goes on like that. Nothing has been changed. Um, just, just I mentioned that uh, there are two parts of, of conflict re resolution, an inborn and the learned part. Uh, there are examples for the learned part, even on the animal level. These guys over here are macaco monkeys, uh, sorry, uh, reese monkeys, and these are the stumptail monkeys. And the right ones are vicious creatures. They are unbearable. They quarrel all the time and fight all the time. They are very aggressive. Unlikely, unlike the others, they are nice, cuties. Well, not by the look, but by their behavior. And, um, and, and they, they, they always just want to feel fine. And they are easygoing and happy. And when they put in an during an experiment, the two groups together, then these guys had a better impact and a greater impact on those guys. So uh, Rhesus monkeys learned how to behave and how to be nice and kind to the others. Uh, primate and human peacemaking, peace, peacemaking. So what, what are the common? things, that we need relationships. Uh, we don't need enemies. And we would like to feel fine and not live together with very high level of stress hormones. But there are distinct differences. Animals uh, practice the win-lose model all the time. They either win or lose, There's no other uh, outcome of a fight. Uh, we have more options. So we have invented the win-win model. And that's gorgeous. Uh, reconciliation behave, behavior exists on the level of, of, uh, of primates. Uh, but they don't, 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 don't feel it necessary to forgive. They don't, don't know the concept of forgiving others. Uh, we do know, and it's a virtue. Uh, from, from an evolutionary point of view, when something is considered to be a virtue, it's very suspicious that it's difficult for us to carry it out. So it's not easy to be virtuous. It's not easy to forgive others. Uh, they don't need to understand why they had a conflict. They just had a conflict, and some of them won. We, want, we, we, we would like to understand why, because next time. So some, something will be changed. Um, when there is a good conflict resolution, that something will be changed after the conflict is somehow set. And we try to adapt our behavior or our goal to, a, to the new situation. So it's better to understand what had happened. Um, they don't think anything must be changed. We think, we do think that yes. Uh, so what, what, what is uh, primary and secondary biological skills? Primary, secondary skill, for example, is speech. 
it, it doesn't not, not doesn't mean that uh, if if a newborn is coming to this world, and if it is left on its own, will learn how to talk. This is not the case. It needs models, needs social environment. Uh, so this is how children learn to speak. They just hear. They take models, and sooner or later really surprisingly sooner, soon they start to talk. Um, what's the case with writing or with reading? Is, is it possible that if, if, if you leave a child or, or children, a group of children in, in a library, a library room alone, then sooner or later they just learn uh, how to read and how to write? No. So these are secondary biological, biological skills. Uh, culture is needed. Uh, you have to step or stand on, on, on the shoulders of, of giants who had invented and, and, and discovered things previously. And this is the case with, with uh, uh, the second level of conflict resolution. Uh, lose or win-lose model is easy. It's easy. It, it just comes. But if you, if you want to, to make win-win model, it is very complicated. You need models. You need to be trained, or to be trained, or to, to learn how to do that. So according to Thomas, um, there are, uh, well, according to this classification, uh, there are at least five possible basic models for conflict re resolution. So the competing is the win, the win-lose model. Well, yes, it's easier. Uh, the other one is avoiding. It is quite popular that I don't want to know about conflict. I just want to run away. Um, so how would, it, how would you describe it? Is it uh, in, in terms of winning and losing? It, is it a win, winning model or losing model? Who loses? Who wins? No one wins. Who loses? Probably both parties lose. So it, it's a kind of lose-lose model. Accommodating model. All right, you are right. Uh, I just do what you want. I don't argue. Uh, it, it, it's a kind of submissive behavior. So what kind? How would you express it? Who, who says it's a win-win model? Who says it's a lose-win model? Yes? I lose, you win. Yes. You win. You. OK, OK. I admit you win. And uh, the compromising, compromising model that um, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, I lose a little bit and I gain a little bit and you gain a little bit and you lose a little bit. And the collaborating is the win-win model. We, we, we try to find new grounds and we try to find or use new skills. And, and um, this is how we uh, create a new environment, a new social environment. This is how we, we find out things. We introduce new things into our, pre in, into our present life. So this is the best one. So if, if we want to get the, the two things together, so well-being and, and uh, uh, conflict resolution, that this form, this form is promising uh, well-being or happiness or, or a, a, a positive outcome. Uh, it's, it's almost the same uh, about passivity and uh, aggressiveness. Um, yeah, uh, why why uh, avoiding conflict uh, cannot be considered a, a, a proper or, or good um, outcome uh, of a conflict situation? Because even if we are not aware of it, conflict will be staying there. So even if we suppress or oppress them, we know that they are moving and working and will be eating up us and eating up the connection. And even if we avoid conflict and we flee away, we won't keep the relationship. So the relationship is lost. Uh, the next question, whether there are cultural differences in conflict resolution, uh, a little bit. But I, I, I had the same problem as, as, as many of us here. Um, that, okay, West. So, yeah, 
Australia is considered to be West, so uh, uh, geographically it's not in the West. Um, so which, which, which cultures or countries uh, belong to the East? Well, Japan, China, what about India? So India is quite different strategies. So this is part of the East, or, of, or, or, or and, and where, where, are, where, where are the cultures from the South? So what about the uh, South American cultures, even native cultures, or, or the um, hierarchic uh, yeah, native cultures? So are there different differences between conflict resolution? Um, so I think these ones, uh, these um, uh, differences have already been mentioned uh, today. So just let's pick holistic. Um, it's important and um, judged by separate attributes and immediate considerations and long-term considerations are very important. Because if, if you concentrate on, on a win-lose strategy, that's okay, I want to win, and you lose, and just feel humiliated and go away and I, I won't see you again, um, it makes me feel good in the short run. Yes, I, I win. But what happens to the group? What happens to the culture? Uh, what happens to the uh, cooperation, mutuality? What happens to what happens to us in the future? So, um, what what are common? Both. East and West cultures, and, and when, when we use East here, then Japanese and Chinese. So they use collaboration, the win-win win, win form. They use compromising. OK, uh, compromising, is, um, both of them win and both of them lose, and avoiding strategies. And what, what are the differences? So Western people are more confrontational and more assertive. It's a form of, well, it's not aggression, it's a mild form of, of, of I, I just, I just um, um, want, I just would like to get what I want, and more competing than, than Eastern people. But, but, um, most, most, most of the, um, uh, uh, studies, uh, the result of most, most, most studies were driven from, from um, in-group situations. And either there were Eastern people or Western people. And if uh, mixed groups are examined, then a, a very interesting trend um, seems to evolve, that they, they mutually watch for one another, and they import the strategies of the other party. So um, Eastern people tend to be more direct, more aggressive, and Western people uh, try to be more considerate. And, um, try to negotiate a little bit more often than before. Uh, this is a, a specific research in conflict management styles. Oh, yeah, so Chinese, uh, Japanese, and Korean, <laughs> Korean people. Um, so most, most of them used uh, from South Korean people compromising style and then the collaborating, and then the accommodating and competing. Uh, how's, how's it with, with um, uh, Americans? Avoiding, avoiding, no clash. And then compromising, and then accommodating, and collaborating, and competing was the last one. So um, that was it. 
And um, so the conclusion is that um, in an intercultural, multicultural environment, um, the participants mutually influence one another. And um, so we are, we, we, we are in a time of um, forming of, a, of, of the global village. Um, so there is a hope that we, are, we will be able to understand mutually one another. Uh, this is an unfair question, I think. But I, I want to look at East and West on a much smaller scale, namely Hungary in the East and Germany in the West, and the issue of the Syrian migrants. I have been trying to map your um, five-point scheme onto uh, what is happening both at the level of individuals reacting to individuals and governments reacting to large bodies of migrants. Can we, can we use your, your scheme uh, uh, to actually, make it's, sense it's, of this? It's not, not only an answer question, it's, it's an, an, an answerable question. So um, I, I just uh, cannot compare the, the level of individuals to the level of, of the mass of people, or the level of the political parties. So, uh, so um, there, there, is, there is East and West. There is a cultural difference between Germany and Hungary, of course. Of course. So everything is very complicated. And uh, now what, what, what we have in, in, in Hungary is, is, is so, it's so, uh, uh, it has so much factors in it, and um, so much, so, so many factors in it, and, and it is interwoven by politics. And it's, it's, it's just, just very difficult to answer. So yes, in the first place, Hungarians want to win. So this is a set strategy. They, they want to use most of the time and they very rarely do win. Because yeah. <laughs> they want it very much. <laughs> I, I, I'm just one sort of different question. Um, I, I mean, you, you, your answer, of course, hides the difference in political parties in Hungary, and, and this is another whole dimension of the, the subcultures within a culture. But I, I'm also interested in the way in which the issue of what is the in crowd and what is the out crowd can either be based on some objective characteristic or can be culturally manufactured. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the cultural revolution in China where uh, people suddenly could be declared class enemies and treated in the most abominable ways. Um, do you have any insight into what allows people to be so nasty to each other? Um, manipulating people is not very difficult. If, if, if someone has the skills, either political or, or, or the mental um, skills. And um, I, I think what, what happened in China, it, it almost the same thing happened in that part of the, of the world where we live. Um, no, so, um, yes, the, 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 the final answer is that um, uh, Within a sentence, or, or, or within two sentences, it, it just cannot be explained and, and cannot, cannot be put in any of, of, of the five, five categories or any of the mentioned categories. So uh, real life is much more complicated than, than putting into little boxes things, uh, because there are no fixed, rigid category of boundaries. And I don't know whether it is an answer for your question. It's the beginning of a conversation. Yes. <laughs> uh, just a conversation again. Um, I've had a philosophical dilemma with myself for a long time. So maybe you can give me some help. Um, from the survival point of view, so we have two things. One is um, the violent population that feels the, f the, the fight, the fright, the fight, and, and they go into defense. So they have this defense mechanism all the time and can defend themselves. Then you have, on the other hand, uh, very much of so-called what we in neuroscience say, top-down, cultivated society. Cultivate in French means, you know, cut, shape, 
Uh, so you mean, you shape, you cut, and in the end, you lose your instincts. So I don't know if you get what I want to say. So I want to say, is there, which of them has better survival? Uh, yeah. Or how do you cope with these things? Um, so, um, in, in all situations, before, before they do something or feel something, they evaluate what, what going, what's going around. So we, we try to identify the, the factors of the thing. So we, 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 try, we try to evaluate what's happening and then to decide what to do. And a lot of things depend on evaluation. So if, if there are others, and, and this is partly the answer for, for the Chinese question, that if there are others who tell us how to evaluate, what is the, fr what is the frame we, we uh, can or must, must or have to uh, interpret things, then we use those strategies and those Google or, or, or screens. Um, so uh, this, this is for the, for the biological, biological part. Uh, so it's, it's, it's easy to, to, to wake mm -hmm. the animal up. Um, uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 the, in, in, in humans, even in humans. And um, I, I often need to not be offend animals because they are much better than that. Um, but what, what, what if we lose all our uh, natural, natural uh, compassive or instincts? Exactly. Um, it's, it's also, I think it's non-adaptive after a while, it's non-adaptive. So if, if the two uh, con are, confl are conf conflicting one another, so th th there, is, there is only a very narrow path. And if, if you go to either side, um, you might be mistaken and you, know, you might be wrong instead of improving things. But so th this is, uh, you need examples because there are no, uh, uh, or no two cases alike. But losing instincts is, is just terrible. Do, do you have an answer? No, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'd like to go back to the first half of the talk, if I may. Um, you started us off by reminding us of Humboldt and Wolf and the issue of to what extent language shapes thought. I think in the end you showed us the diversity of ways in which language can shape thinking about language. Yeah. But I don't think you followed through on how it shapes our thinking more generally. Uh, could you summarize your opinion on that? Yeah. I sort of uh, skipped there because I myself am in favor when I am talking about sort of uh, constrained relativity. By constrained, I mean that many of us are involved in trying to see how the different cognitive resources are, are sort of uh, um, assembled together to solve the tasks of language processing. So I'm in favor of a language-to-language -language relativity attitude. But uh, that doesn't answer your question about, about the issue of how language shapes thought. Let me give you another example, which I was not using on my slides, but we have been doing research during the last 10 years a lot on the Levinson framework. Levinson is a researcher at the MPI in Nijmegen, and he has been making a lot of studies on the impact, on the supposed impact of uh, language structure on space orientation. And his basic idea is that there are some American Indian languages like Tzeltal and so on, which are not using an ego-centered frame, but they are using more a more, a more um, sort of um, absolute frame of reference when talking about space relations, unlike Indo-European languages, which are talking about in front of me and so on. So he had been showing in many studies, but only comparing Tzeltal children with Dutch university students, that there is such an influence of language and so on. And we started, among other people, we started to make very uh, extensive studies with different age groups and different settings. And what we find is that the space orientation 
you use, namely that something you locate regarding to your body scheme or regarding to the frame given by the room and so on, depends on three different factors. And language is certainly one of the factors in this non-linguistic situation, but only one factor. The other is education, and the third is the actual context. So what we find in a strange way for Hungarian, Hungarian is an, as a language, is an extremely ego-centered language. We have a very elaborate system of suffixed uh, uh, postpositions like uh, behind my back and so on, and stuff like that. Still, with age, the more accustomed children become to language, supposedly, the less egocentric they become in Hungarian, and it depends on their education level and so on. And uh, starting to read and write makes them even less egocentric. So we sort of make a compromised claim where language is only one of the factors in contextual determination of these non-linguistic orientation schemas like space orientation. And of course, you might, as a good psychometrician, you might ask, that, well, what's the percentage of the contribution of language? That would be hard to explain, but in, in our general model, the contribution is lang of language is something like 50% explained variance, and age and education have about 50% explained variance. I mean, that's a comment on the question. That's the kind of way we are approaching this issue. So we are not denying that language has an influence on cognitive functions, but functions but we think it, it has more a modulating than a determining influence. So we don't believe, or I personally don't believe that language sets up uh, barriers for understanding speakers of other languages. It certainly makes certain things easier. Just to give you another example. Hungarian is, uh, Hungarian is a non-copula language, which is a funny language. So when we say something like uh, um, uh, raven is a bird, we're not using is a. So we're not using copula. That doesn't mean that Hungarian children are unable to learn Aristotelian logics. They can handle it. But certainly, it implies that it would have been very difficult to figure out Aristotelian syllogistic reasoning to start with in a non-copula language. You see my point. So you can handle the system, but the system, the language made easier for the Greeks to to formalize a, um, syllogistic reasoning rules in a copula-based language. One more question? If not, let me say thank you. Great thank thanks you. to both of you. Thank you. Thank you.